Art Photography panel for today, uh, and I'm just going to do some bio stuff so that we know who everybody is, and in case you don't know, I'm assuming most of you are probably amateur to professional photographers potentially, I know there's a few mixed in there, so, uh, but in case you don't know, this is Daniel Bowd. Daniel's uh, photography blossomed from Sydney's music and creative scene, which he documented in his website, Bowdus, since 2003. He was a fixture at clubs like Purple Sneakers and shot live music around Sydney consistently. At least when I was growing up, I saw him every night with a camera, pretty much. In 2007, Daniel was appointed Chief Photographer for Time Out Sydney, shooting everything from portraits of celebrities like Robin Williams and countless artists of a comparable scale, chefs, drag queens, sports stars, food, cocktails and sex toys. He continues his love for shooting musicians with his assignments from publications like Rolling Stone, Enemy, Q, Kerrang! and Faster Louder. As well as editorial work, Dan shoots publicity photos for artists, plus acts as official photographer for festivals like Vivid Sydney, Laneway and Leeds Festival. Please welcome Daniel Bauer. <laughs> Just next to him here is Pat, Pat Stevenson. Pat brings the party before he shoots it and amidst the mayhem snaps the best portrait of the week. From fashion launches to VIP after parties and weddings, Pat's the guy. Organisers of Park Life and Stereosonic Festivals have hired him and his crew, Hobo Gestapo, have assisted in Shop Fashion Week for mainstream media for the last three years running. On the corporate end, Pat's shot high profile campaigns for alcohol, alcohol brands including Absolute and Smirnoff, and although employed as a. Oh, pardon me. Uh, uh, Smirnoff Vodka, Shivas Regal, Jamisons and Hendricks. Fashion leaders including Hermes, Chanel, and Subi have also utilised this talent. Pat has taken out pedestrians, uh, Pedestrian X's Ray Bans Photographer of the Year flown to the US to shoot Lollapalooza and hosted a string of successful summer parties at Sydney's Ivy Complex. Pat is also an uh, electro-act Peking Ducks personal photographer and travels with the band shooting their live performances. This year will only be Pat's fifth as a professional photographer. Please welcome Pat Stevenson. <laughs> Kai. No, no. Kai Griffin. Kai's fate was sealed as an event photographer ten years ago when she stumbled upon the book U2, Far Away So Close by B.P. B. B. Fallon. She didn't hate getting their uh, free iTunes record this year either. <laughs> Actually, I did. Uh, everyone did. <laughs> I improvised that. Uh, coupling her love of music with her love of capturing the moment in uh, photographic form, Kai set about perfecting her craft and getting amongst the best events with her camera. Now working with Sydney event photography organiser, organisation Voina, is that Vona. it? Voina. thank you, it's really hard to pronounce. I know. Kai recently returned from shooting in New York City for uh, Robert Hart's infamous Halloween party. Travelled to Stry Stradbroke this weekend, just finished to shoot Seth Troxler in a decadent pool party setting, and can list some of the best names in house music as, uh, in her lens sites over the last few years. Jamie Jones, Maceo Flex, Art Department Dixon, and many more. It all sounds glamorous, but to get the perfect shots, there's been a lot of dedication and more than a little lost sleep and a few bruises. Please, put your hands together. <laughs> Alright, next to Kai, we have Jared Seng, who is a late addition to the bill, and we appreciate him turning up. Uh, Jared is an Australian-based photographer, obviously, filmmaker and creative director with a special love of music, travel, and the arts. He's gained international recognition for his work with high-profile artists such as Passenger, Matchbox 20, and Ed Sheeran. In recent years, Jared has established himself as one of Perth's most prol uh, prolific creatives, working on projects as diverse as international tours, hidden concerts, art installations, and short films. His work's been viewed by tens of millions worldwide and featured on MTV, BBC One, BuzzFeed, VH1, Channel V, Canon Advertisements, The Australian, Rolling Stone, and numerous other media outlets, publications, and blogs. His award-winning uh, his award-winning images have been showcased in exhibitions at home and abroad, and in 2013, Jared was selected as a finalist in the WA Young Person of the Year. Jared Sang. <laughs> Tim Levy. Tim gave me a pretty cut-down bio, but it still has a lot of freelance work on there. Uh, he studied a Diploma of Photography at Sydney Tech, and has since then been doing pretty much everything you can do as a freelance photographer. Uh, he also curates photodoco.com, which is a site that, that compiles uh, and edits photos to showcase photographers' work for commercial usage. Is that accurate, Tim? Um, close. It's hard for me to get this right. But it, it, it acts as a conduit between photographers, galleries, and the um, publishers and um, the, the art industry. Sure, okay. So, as well as curating that, he curates the Conductor's Project Gallery, which is one of Australia's busiest public art spaces, shoots events and uh, portraits and projects for various PR and media companies, 
Uh, he's a Photographer of the Year judge in 2013 and 2014 for the Australian Photography Magazine. And previously, has, this is, there's so much here, it is actually literally difficult to list, but um, he was the head of the Bragg's photography department, so ran five photographers under him for some time. Head photographer for SBS's Arts and Culture website. Uh, he's worked for the Sydney Morning Herald, Rolling Stone, The Telegraph, The Bulletin, Vogue, Who, Oyster, Vice, Yen, NW, 3D, Catalogue, Drum. It just, it really does go on a lot. And they're, um, all, they're all defunct now. <laughs> yeah, all of those papers are folded due to his work. Yeah. Right now. Especially yeah. knitting monthly. <laughs> Which was huge prior yeah. to that. Um, and anyway, look, he's, he's extremely pro prolific and successful uh, and also won the head-on uh, landscape prize in 2013 for his fine art project. Uh, and then at the end, last but not least, Kira Chevelle, a multidisciplinary photographer. Uh, she considers herself a better retoucher uh, or at least used to. Um, she spent time in high school watching YouTube tutorials about Photoshop and building websites, eventually studying digital media at COPA with a focus on graphic design and studio photography. Then she moved into the real world and made marketing posters for bands on the side while she worked as a digital designer or the head of digital design at Shine Australia, a production company for t uh, responsible for TV shows like The Voice, The Biggest Loser, Master Chef, and The Bachelor. She's excited about moving towards being a freelance photographer right now, but has shot a lot of those photos over there that look like the closing scenes of a television show. <laughs> because they are. Uh, anyway, well, that's everyone. So please give them a round of applause. And we'll get <laughs> I figured we'd start today's event. Can everybody see, by the way? Should I stand? Would that make it easier? Yeah, I'll just stand for the moment. Um, I figured we'd start today's event with a couple of questions because I'm not really sure whether everybody in the audience has a background in photography or otherwise. And also I thought the most interesting thing for these guys maybe to get together and discuss was both the weird stuff that happens to them when they're doing their jobs, because it is one of the weirder jobs you can probably have, uh, and then also the future of the industry as they see it, because over the next few years obviously things, or and the last few years, things have radically changed in freelance photography in the same way it has in print journalism and everything else. And I think people are kind of interested in talking about that on the panel to some degree at least. Um, but I thought I'd ask the panel to start with what kind of personality makes a great photographer and particularly a great event photographer? Well, hiring brag photographers for seven years, I found that you'd get these loose unit party kids that were the best photographers and they get great photo uh, party photos because they'd encourage everyone to have fun and you know that approach people and you know that play with them and they come up with these great photographs. But on the flip side, they were totally unreliable and they'd miss deadlines and you're going, I'm trying to help you out here. But then you'd get some very diligent, more straight up photographers who would make deadlines, that answer all your calls, that be consistent. And so, you know, you've got to strike a balance between both. You know, like you got to, if you're, if you're going to be a social photographer or a party photographer, you've got to work it. Like Pat, bring the party. <laughs> so, like, you know, yeah, you've got to work it. But I think some of those loose units can be rung in a bit and you can sort of teach them the way. And so you go, just bring it back a couple of notches. Yeah. And get, drink about get trolley years. for the weekend and then get your shit together on yeah. Monday. Sure. Yeah. Would everyone kind of agree that that's part of what you do is to kind of like move between being both a personality in that sense and then also reliable. I mean, I know, Dan, you sort of split the difference pretty well with that because you are at everything, but you're also at home doing the work too. At least that's yeah. what I know of you. Yeah. I think photography suits all personalities. Like, my wife, Sabelle, is an excellent professional photographer and she's very exuberant. She really puts herself out there and, you know, she walks into a room and you're like, oh, Sabelle's here. Whereas I walk into a room and you wouldn't know. I'm very quiet and... You do have completely different styles of yeah. doing things. And, and both approaches work well. I, I, when I started, as you said, I was shooting purple sneakers. I used, I'm very shy, so I hated approaching people. So I'd have to have a few drinks before I even started because I just couldn't handle approaching people. Mm -hmm. But this is, that was like 10 years ago now. So now I've, I've lost that fear. Do you have a process that you go through to set up with subjects, whether it's studio or, or event, uh, that kind of breaks down those early barriers? Is that is that something that needs to happen? Yeah, you've got to just talk to people like you would talk to them normally. 
I don't, I don't have any tricks, but I just approach people and chat with them as if, you know, they're a friend of mine and, and just explain to them what's, what we're doing today and make sure they're comfortable. And sure. It's, I often relate photography to like being a doctor or dentistry, you've got to have a really good bedside manner. Yeah, you do. It's and also your patients are often naked. <laughs> <laughs> that happens way more than it seems like it should be. <laughs> Between us too. Yeah, that's true. I was going to say, well, that's, that's our experience. It's yeah, like, it really it's is. It's not everyone's. <laughs> no. Yeah. Maybe that's me. <laughs> Uh, does anyone else have a similar experience with me? <laughs> not, not with you personally, but with other, with other human beings, definitely. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, pads are on the floor, that's, that's different. But. Yeah, that seems to be a... Uh, there's weird stuff, I mean, like getting some of these images printed out, obviously, you know, there's a lovely one of Kira's over there with this dude with his tooth knocked out from Big Day Out. Hopefully we'll be talking about these a little bit later. Um, and Pat's got some really crazy ones of that guy injured on the ground there and stuff. Yeah. Like that. That's really hectic, that photo. So, I mean, you're obviously kind of putting yourself in situations that the average person really isn't in generally and then having to deal with that. Um, although we will be talking about those photos specifically, I'd love to hear from anyone who has, and I feel like you're going to say something, who just okay. has some crazy... I've got too much to say, man. I'm, yeah. so, I'm so thankful I take the photos because I just forget about them. Like, they can be the right. most intense thing that's happened that yeah. weekend, but by the next week, I'm like, yeah, that just sort of blends into... Like it. a war photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, man. Shooting the cross four nights a week. Different it's like a war zone. Yeah. 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 A lot more pingers involved, I think. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's insane. Out of the cross. I mean, if I, I could speak about that right now. The, the gentleman with... Uh, I'll sort of come over. Can everyone hear that and see that? Uh, maybe maybe everyone on the panel, see if you can project yeah. a little more, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. So this photo here in particular was taken in 2008 in King's Cross, outside um, World Bar. Um, this, this guy here was sort of having a bit of an argument with another guy, and before you know it, the other guy sort of like punched him in the groin. It actually stabbed him in the leg and um, severed his femoral artery, which is the main artery, and it feeds blood to the leg. So blood was pouring out the top of his jeans leaking down his pants and like overflowing out of his shoe down the road. And by then he sort of didn't know what had happened and he fell over. And luckily this guy was with the bike, he was a nurse, and um, he put the guy's pants down and put some pressure on the wound. And in about 30 seconds there was about 500 common police officers there. Wow. And about a minute the ambulance was there. So amazing. Really was the guy good. okay? Yeah, he survived apparently. And I think I've got a photo in my photo from uh, previous in the night, like earlier on in the night, where the like, guy stabbed him, was in the photo, and they got a positive ID wow. and arrested the guy. So, yeah, that was just like a shooting photos of Candice apartment that night. I went out in front, with my mates having a cigarette, and then I sort of captured that. And I felt really bad taking that photo at the time, but now I can look back at it and go, that's sort of like photojournalism almost in a way. Like, yeah. They're just taking photos of girls <laughs> and doing that all night, <laughs> and then change it over to that. So, I mean, if something around you is happening, you've got to be aware all the time. And if you've got a camera on you, just snap away. Sure. Yeah, so that's that particular story. It's pretty intense. It really caught my eye because he looks terrible and it's yeah. scary. And it's also outside the realm. I mean, there's, there's a fair range of photos here. Um, but, you know, for example, it's Kira and your photos are polar, you know, uh, leagues apart in terms of what you're capturing. You're getting a very kind of composed image of the voice and those kinds of events yeah. where things are very... I think there's together. definitely, you kind of experience that as well. Like, I mean, I've been working reality TV and um, a lot of the times you're told to go and snap the girl crying or like, you know, just like really, like moments where you just don't feel comfortable <laughs> being in that place and you kind of just really need to get in there and just do it and treat yourself like a photojournalist because you, you do get into situations where, personally, I don't feel comfortable like taking photos of a girl that's just walked off the stage because she hasn't gotten through on the voice or whatever. Um, but yeah, you kind of just you just gotta snap away and get rid of the uh, the connotations to do with it sometimes. So one thing that does kind of link all of you guys is that essentially on some level you started shooting live music. And given that it's a Music New South Wales seminar, I feel that we need to at least tacitly acknowledge music <laughs> <laughs> to justify our funding to our partners. And stuff. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted everyone to kind of talk about their first experience shooting live music and whether that was an addictive thing, whether that was the reason that you continued, um, and whether you continue to do that today. It's very much an addictive thing. Um, I knew what I wanted to do since I was 17, so, I mean, I had this idea and I had no idea how to get into it, and I actually just fell into it completely ass backwards. Um, I would have been 20, 20, 24 
and I was on holiday completely randomly and I was up in Byron Bay and the Jezebels were playing at the Great Northern and I took my camera along and I shot it and I was supposed to be on holiday with a friend of mine and we were supposed to do a bunch of stuff after the show but I just spent the entire night looking at, looking at the photos I'd shot and going, no, this is, this is exactly what I want to do and just kind of fumbled my way through it for a little bit until I fell into doing actually the same way Dan started. I took over, I was one of the last photographers that Purple Sneakers ever had before they closed. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there it just kind of snowballed. Uh, I ended up shooting for Tim for a while at the Bragg and building contacts and now this is what I do for a living and sometimes it's you know, a very hectic living but it's taking me everywhere I want to go and it's exactly what I want to do. It's also pretty much my entire life. Yeah, um, I don't exactly have much of a life outside of my job. This is, if you want to do this full time, if this is all you want to do, if you want to be travelling with bands, if you want to be travelling the world and covering festivals, events, touring with musicians, touring with acts, you're not going to get much of a personal life. So you have to weigh up how valuable is having a partner, how valuable is having friends who don't work in this industry, how valuable are your nights at home alone where you get to just do nothing uh, versus your dream. And if your dream is more valuable to you than all that other stuff, then you know what you should be doing. And sometimes it does get really, really tiring, but at the same time it's also incredibly rewarding. Um, these these five photos here are mine. I don't know if I can understand. If you want to, yeah, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, leading on, this is a photo I took with the Jezebels at one of their shows at FBI Social I think earlier this year, and the reason I included this is because they've been a band uncovered periodically throughout my career. And they're not only great performers, but they're absolute legends. And they, for some reason, always remember me, even though I try to make myself very conspicuous. And I consider every time I shoot them, I look at the photos that I take of them, and I'm like, I can see my progress as a photographer and my improvement. Now, these room here are actually all mark different points in my career that I consider landmark points. These two were from my first international assignment. Uh, how many of you know what the Festival of Burning Man is? Oh my god, that, that makes me really happy. So these two are from my first international assignment, which was shooting Burning Man uh, content for a book about the music of Burning Man, which is pretty much everyone else who covers Burning Man covers the art, the spiritual side of things, and the fact that there are a lot of drugs taken at this festival. And not many people touch on the music side of it. So I was contracted to go out and shoot photos that sort of capture the music side of things. Now, this was taken on something called Robot Heart, as is this, which is one of the main camps at Burning Man, like the biggest music camps. And I included these two, one because this is this was considered one of my best photos to come out of the photos I shot last year. And it's just, to me, that's, I find that to be one of my favourite photos from that year because it captures a lot of a lot of the feel of Burning Man. It's, it's a lot like that. It's very wild and it's very, very free. This is the exit line of Burning Man, so it takes, it takes you about a day to get in and out of the festival. So you can see this dark line on the horizon. That's all cars uh, and RVs and massive cars and RVs. And it just goes on for about a day. I think it goes to because that was the first time I ever got actually paid to go and do what I love in another country, which was mind blowing. It was, and it was a huge, huge experience. But at the same time, it was like I have to give up about a month of my life to go do this, and I was perfectly okay with that. Doing that, uh, these two <coughs> represent something slightly different. This was the first time I was ever asked to take a photo for Robot Heart as their photographer. So when I met them. Last year, it was for me a uh, moment of realisation that I want to work with these people because they throw, they put on events all around the globe and wanting to work with them was something that I, I realised last year and this year it became a reality. So that was the first photo I was ever asked to take, take for them of their setup. A uh, picture is their bus, which is kind of their mobile art stage, and their two mascots, Prango and Shady Bot. And they ended up using that on their Facebook page as a thank you for the artists. Uh, the other one is of their Halloween party, which I was actually paid to shoot for them this year at Halloween. So I just got back from that a couple of weeks ago, and it was honestly, it was actually, uh, actually really mind blowing, but you know, kind of crazy in depth. I feel really out of my depth way, but uh, they ended up coming back and saying they loved it all. So, but yeah, these, 
I do not have much of a social life outside of doing this. Uh, but, but it makes, by doing it makes me really happy. I think your passion for the event shows in the photos and obviously their commitment to you has reflected that, you know, I mean, you've been talking about that event for a, at least a year. For Burning Man? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I fell in love with it the first time I went, but um, it's not something that you jump into like No, it seems like a lot of the people here would probably, potentially, I hope, agree, or I wonder, um, whether your passion for an individual event or a, a band, for example, kind of re is reflected in the photos that you end up taking of those people. Do you guys have any personal stories that are similar? I guess I started when I started shooting music as well. I've got a bit of an experience with Purple DJ, um, Purple Seekers. Oh. Um, I did a lot of portrait stuff and, for him. I think I, I feel like he's been a bit of a name in the industry. But when I started, exactly very similar. I kind of just started shooting um, the faster, louder, and just being a contributor. I don't know if any of you are contributors, but. Um, they can use and abuse you, but also it's a really good place to start and to kind of, you know, get, well, not pay, but you get free tickets to kind of go and hang out and see really cool bands. Yeah, I think everybody's done these social photos yeah. as set up for their jobs, but you often aren't being paid or barely being paid. Totally. So how do you get through that? Um, I mean, look, like I said, I've been working as a graphic designer for the last three years because I have enough of it. I, I, um, I was shooting a lot of bands and then I it turned into portraits. So, I mean, maybe I'll just stop over here. This is my kind of stuff here. One of my favourite... I mean, what's really cool about when you shoot bands and stuff, tour, like as a contributor, is that you can hang out in the music industry, um, you know, you get to see what you're doing and stuff like that. One of the acts that I used to follow around a lot were Daisy Death Race. And I remember they were just like, you know, two guys showing on stage with a, a heap of, like, you know, kick drums or whatever. It was just two guys with a lot of stories. I took a lot of friends around and they were No, they exist. They exist? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're guitar players are tour managers, so oh, awesome. they're playing it. Yeah. Well, when, before the leaks in Equia, they were starting to go up a bit of pace. You find out, like, I mean, if you can get into J and stuff like that, you just, there's just a network there that you kind of, you, you jump off each other, you know, I mean, FBI, and um, but, but yeah, so because of the Navy, um, I knew the, the guy who was going to be me, and then he kind of dropped me into contact with, you know, a lady who and they're like, hey, do you want to shoot um, your day out? That was awesome. Um, 
because I was doing the gig, and then, as you can see, there's 20,000 people there, so it was kind of a bit of pressure at the time. There is a theme here. I think this is actually something that Tim wanted to talk about yesterday. I'd love to discuss this with the panel. Um, because some of you are also working as photographers now and potentially doing all of the free stuff that these guys are talking about as we speak, let's chat about money. Excuse because, me. Yes. Uh, before, before you finish, can I just ask yeah. you about like, all the info there? Because Technically later, yeah. um, unless there's unless there's an appropriate moment for everyone yeah. to discuss that stuff. Or if you look, if everyone here's shooting and wants to talk about that stuff, we can absolutely do that. Um, but I just don't know where everyone's skill level yeah. is at. So having really specific technical discussion might be a little alienating to some of the more uh, the less advanced members. Um, on, on that note, Jake, yeah. I, I would actually say. That Complete opposite of most of the stuff you just yeah, said. Right. Disagreement. Yeah. 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 But, Roger yeah. Huston disagrees. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would never shoot AV. Yeah. I would uh, always shoot manual. Yeah. I would, uh, well, yeah, keep adjusting. Totally. And I wouldn't. I just wait for the lights to turn up on the audience. I, oh, you can't. Yeah, you can't. I'm, I'm yeah. Yeah. to agree with Dan. Like I've, I've tried shooting AV, and then I found that more of my photos were unusable yeah. than if I shot manual and then timed it right because. Something you will learn, especially if you're shooting live music, the lights do change really frequently, but 
there's usually a pattern. If the lighting guy is any good, and they usually are, yeah. especially shooting something like Big Day Out, they know what they're doing. Like they're not just fucking around. The music, the lights will change in time with the music to a point that you can figure out what's going to happen and you time your shot. I mean, a lot of it, sometimes you, you will find that you're literally running around and just pressing the shutter and praying, praying to praying to whatever you believe in that something's going to turn out. Yeah. But at one point you do, like you get a hang of the lights and you realise what's going on. Do you? <coughs> yes, yeah. 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 There we go. Um, and you said Prices based on the cost of doing business, how to put the margins on the top of that, and that sort of scenario. But starting off as a photographer, a lot of the people, especially in the business industry, are very reluctant to you know, pay anything over $50 to you know, have you attend a meeting, just for really the cover your costs. So prices, as much as they're ideal, don't seem to follow it. And I've also been told by a couple of people um, that have been in the In case people can't hear that, basically he's saying that price lists are well and good, but he's found that they've deterred some business because people are willing to undercut or, or set prices as low as, what, $50 yeah. a shoot, which doesn't cover costs. And he's saying, how is it, how can I make a living doing this or set up my shoots in a way that's even covering my costs when people are so willing to pay so little for photography. And in fact, Tim was, I'd like to address Tim on this because we were talking about this yesterday during yeah. the interview. Well, I actually started in the 90s where you shot on this thing called film. And, um, so it's basically boiled down to a dollar a photograph. So you weren't like just blasting away and you go, oh, that cost, I went through five rolls and you know, like, you could do one shoot and that's $200 just off the bat straight away. Yeah. But um, I've, I'm lucky in that I've always broken it into, if you want to hire my services, you've got to pay. But if I want to do something, I'll, take, I'll do it as a compromise. I, I might bring my price down. But you've got to like get in those two camps because you can't forget that people are using you as a photographer. But they're is it using more you. challenging, they're like, you say? They're using your photographs to benefit their business. Yeah. You know, and, and don't, don't think otherwise. It's difficult now, I suppose. Please. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, about the cost, like, of shooting all these events and concerts. Like, did you guys initially have to pay, like, for the concert tickets, the taxi rides home, or, like, what's the cost of getting into this, like, besides the actual music itself? It varies. Uh, yes, a lot of the time you do have to pay for your own transport costs, but if, say, like, okay, for my, for my first experience shooting a band, I had to pay for a ticket to get in. Um, but then after that, once I had my work out there, I found a lot of it become, it comes down to getting accredited as media, which gets you access to the photo pit. And part of that is putting yourself out there and sending your photos to publications, um, things like that. Like, how did I run into you, Tim, to start shooting for the brand? Was it, I think it was, it was a couple of things. Um, yeah, I think I was shooting a gig and you were also shooting. I'm going, we're looking for brag. Yeah, topics. so from that... Through the brag and through Tim, I got media accreditation, which let me build on my portfolio. These days, I don't shoot a lot of stuff for publications. Um, as Jake said, I work with a collective called Vona, and we're a bunch of music photographers and event photographers, and we can apply for accreditation through that. But still, a lot of getting to the gigs, um, like for instance, if I want to go, shoot, yeah, they like they, they won't shoot for it. They won't pay for your transport or your costs unless you shoot in for them. So, I mean, if I want to go shoot Strawberry Fields next weekend, I need to get myself down to Victoria. Um, if, I were, if I was shooting for Strawberry Fields, they would have to get me down there. So there's, there is a difference there. But it goes from shooting, getting accredited, and then if they like you enough, that's when they hire you, and that's when it becomes an all-expenses-paid thing. Um, on, on that point, I, I never went to school to learn photography. So I had a day job, and I worked doing photography in my evenings and on my weekends and that my, a lot of that first period I wasn't paid for I had to pay for all my own transport I used to pay for, to go to concerts and just take my camera in just for the love of it not intending to make a career out of it and so I, I consider that first period like my schooling and so I was benefiting more by paying to do it because I was learning so much at the time so it was like 
quid pro quo. Yeah, that yeah. you're doing for yourself. So, so, like, so I was learning so it. much. I didn't care if I wasn't getting paid off. It was costing me to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you get to a certain point, you're like, okay, I've, I've worked, I, I now actually am adding value rather than getting value. And, and, and you've spent 10 grand on gear. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's when I started saying, okay, well, now I need to earn some more money back from it. But only after I, I was worth it. Because for yeah. that first few years, you're not worth it. You're not worth mm. getting paid for you're it. Yeah, you're honest. not worth it, okay? <laughs> Dan bounces, you aren't worth it.